Um, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here and talk to you all. It's been a really cool meeting so far, um, and I've been having a lot of fun. Um, I did not change my title, and I took the directive seriously, and I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing as a model for how we can use uh, um, population-based approaches to inform how we understand um, microbial biogeography. So this picture is chosen because of its fusion of retro and futuristic <laughs> elements. Because the work that I'm going to talk about is using really classical approaches, but I think that we're uh, speaking to questions that are current. I don't have to say what the limitations of culture-based work uh, are. Um, but I want to remind you all that there's this really cool thing about culture-based work, which is once you have something in culture, you have it in culture. So that's something that we're going to be um, and, and it's sort of the key of, of where I'm going for the rest of the talk. So why Pseudomonas? Um, well, so the, the part of the backstory that I didn't intend to tell you, but is uh, that it's partly a ploy to get uh, first generation college students who think they're not interested in ecology, interested in ecology, because they, they're interested in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But the other reason is because um, it's, uh, it's really well suited for the kinds of questions that I want to answer. Um, because Pseudomonas use a broad range of resources in the lab, and in the microbiology uh, community has strains of all kinds of Pseudomonas species from all over the place. And they're called ubiquitous. As an ecologist, when I hear ubiquitous, I stop because it makes me um, curious. Um, because of this, what we know a group is capable of is not the same as knowing what it actually is doing. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. How do conditions in the home affect where Pseudomonas live? So what I'm showing here is a cartoon of Hutchinson's model of the realized niche, the realized niche being where organisms are actually found, the, the actual environments in which organisms are found. And he laid out three main uh, categories of forces that delimit the realized niche. And what I'm going to do today is talk about all four of these things very, very briefly each of them very briefly. So where and in what numbers are Pseudomonas species found in homes? We do this culture-based approach. I'm going to talk about two studies, those cross-sectional and the longitudinal. We sample everywhere. So we go to people's homes and we sample. We have a list of between 100 and we now up to about 150 places that are on our list that we look for. Not everybody has a hot tub. So not, you know, not every house gets all 150 samples taken. But uh, the, the purpose of this is to try to look broadly, not only in places where we expect to see it, but also in places where we might be surprised. Also, if we want to say that something isn't somewhere, I think it's important to look. So in this cross-sectional study, uh, it was really a preliminary study. We looked at 972 samples from 22 homes. Each home sampled once. Um, and using Pseudomonas isolation auger, which that's another thing that's very convenient, convenient about Pseudomonas, it's easy to isolate. Um, we have 313 isolates, which we now identify through 16S sequence. And I've taken those 150 sites and binned them there on the uh, left into seven categories. Um, our, uh, our MD collaborator hates this one on the, on the left, which is, we call it inside vertebrates, <laughs> because there's such low yield there. Um, so what you can see is uh, the, the total number of samples taken in each of these different types of places, and then uh, what we get back in terms of pseudomonas, and this is all pseudomonas. Um, and we have rates of recovery from as low as 4% for inside vertebrates to uh, close to 50% from soils. Um, this curve basically looks like the distribution of uh, Pseudomonas putative recovery because putative made up the vast majority of the Pseudomonas that we got in, in homes. And this is to group because 
trying to get finer than that with Imputida is messy. Um, a very distant second was Pseudomonas originosa group um, species, and there we got two and a half percent of our samples yielded uh, originosa. In our longitudinal study, we did even worse in terms of recovering originosa. Um, and then the rest of the pseudomonas made up another two and a half percent of our uh, samples. So I don't have time to talk to you about distributions of each of the different of different species in any kind of detail. But I do want to point out what the distribution looks like for originosa because I want to talk more about originosa and because it's really different from putida and uh, the other things that we looked at. And that's what I'm showing you here. You can see that 15% of the samples that we took um, in drains yielded originosa and we see almost no originosa anywhere else. So in the homes, what we find is that originosa is not a soil bug or a water bug, it's a drain bug. Um, okay, so it's hard to find and it's in drains. Following up with Pseudomonas originosa, I wanna look at whether or not we can separate out uh, the degree to which what we find in a particular place is driven by dispersal opportunity as opposed to selection by uh, the local environment. And to do that, we're gonna look at similarity among Pseudomonas originosa genotypes and ask whether they can be predicted from geographic proximity or environmental similarity. And this is work mostly um, by Tom Hundley, who's a technician in my lab. For this, we're using the strains collected in the longer longitudinal study, um, uh, which the sampling uh, and any one sampling event is like the one that I just told you about. It has a couple of differences. First, there are fewer houses. We only looked at 15 houses, but sampled each of those houses eight times, up to eight times. Half of those houses included um, a family member with cystic fibrosis. So that means that we have, a, we have more upper respiratory samples uh, with originosa. Interestingly, there's no other differences uh, between houses with CF members and, and, and other houses. Um, if anything, there's slightly lower recovery rates um, of pseudomonas. Um, for this sample, uh, this experiment, we took 11,600 plus samples. Um, and uh, we have uh, over 1,000 pseudomonas isolates, 148 of which are originosa. So they're not that easy to get from the home environment. Um, and what we did was look at genetic similarity based on analysis of 12 mini, sat, uh, mini satellite loci. We went with VNTRs because we were worried that um, multi-locus sequence analysis was not going to give us enough variability to really distinguish strains from within a home, which we wanted to be able to do. And the basic idea is that if dispersal limitation is what's important for determining what you see where, then uh, the organisms that are most closely related are going to be from the same place. And if it's local adaptation that's driving what you see where, then things that are more closely related will be from the same environments. So what we did was um, uh, use Permanova, so permutational MANOVA, to look at the distance matrices, uh, the genetic distance matrices, and correlate that uh, information with the location of isolation. So these are distance trees that are really just here, so you can see the distance information that's going into the models. Okay, and the the colors uh, for the the at the tips there are uh, for the house of isolation. So what I did to look at just the house of isolation, um, and what I've done here is sort of sliced the data a couple of different ways. To look at the house of isolation, I took um, uh, samples from multiple rooms in the house, but only one sample per room. Okay, so, uh, so any similarity that there is within a house has to do with being in the house, not being confined in a single room. And when I do that, um, we see that there's a, a pretty good correlation, this pretty good predictive power of knowing the house of isolation. So uh, that looks like there's genetic isolation among houses. Um, 
Uh, okay, and you can sort of see that on the tree. There's uh, places where you can see there's a kitchen, a person, a bathroom, all from one house clustering together. What I would have liked to have done to look at location would be to do a nested model, but the data are just too sparse to do that. So what I did instead was take a single room in a house and look at all of the, the strains that we get from that one room. So now I have a location um, variable which, which includes both the house of isolation and the location within the house. And what you can see is that when I, when I look at whether or not that location information helps me predict genetic similarity, I, it does very well with an R squared of 0.77. And you can see that very nicely in the, in the um, tree. Now it's not really fair to compare R squareds between data sets that are not the same, but I think um, the, this is anecdotal evidence um, and the best that we can do to, to suggest that locations, that isolation by distance is going on within houses as well as between them. So there's lots of different environments that we sampled and lots of different things that we were interested in looking at. We looked at variation among different kinds of drains. We looked at drains versus kitchen sink sponges and all kinds of things that I can't tell you about. I'm just going to tell you about um, a comparison of the upper respiratory strains and the drain strains. So, and it, for this model, it's a two-way factorial model because we know that house is really important. Um, and there it is doing its thing, being important. Um, there's also a marginally significant interaction between house and, and the environment um, of isolation, uh, which basically is saying that in some houses there's greater similarity between what you see in the, in the person and in the drains than in others. And there's an overall difference between drain and upper respiratory strains uh, in, uh, in terms of genetic similarity. So if I could sort of tell a little story about what this, uh, these data are suggesting, I think it's that um, getting to a new site is a limiting factor. There's isolation by distance among homes, which makes sense, but also even within homes. Those things in kitchens are more like other things in kitchens than they are like things in bathrooms. But that if you came from a drain and you arrive at another drain, you probably have an edge over other things that came from other kinds of environments, like a, like a upper, upper respiratory strain. Okay, so I'm gonna tell a couple of vignettes now. Um, we're interested in, in looking at phenotype and trying to understand what some of the drivers may be of differences that we see. So we are interested in adaptation to the abiotic environment, and we've been looking specifically with interactions with surfaces. So uh, a former undergrad in my lab, Michael France, uh, spent the summer, so these are really new data, uh, looking at a whole bunch of surface, um, surface interaction-related traits. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one, which is really hard, really hard to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about attachment um, and look at whether or not originosa genotypes from drains and upper respiratory systems are <coughs> with respect to attachment. Um, so why attachment and why surfaces out of all the things in the, in the abiotic environment that we could have looked at? Well, we know that uh, attachment and biofilm formation are really important both in drains and in upper respiratory systems, but that the nature of the surfaces that they're interacting with are really different. Uh, so there would be a, an opportunity for selection uh, for divergence in those in traits associated with surfaces. What we did was use those uh, um, mini satellite data to choose strains to, to work on. Um, and what you can see here is that these are the 13 strains that Michael worked with and they, are, they fall into three groups of uh, more closely related strains, and within each group there are both uh, upper respiratory and drain strains. So we did that to try to control for phylogenetic relatedness. So what we see, if there's overall differences between drain and upper respiratory, it should be driven by the environment, not by history. And I should mention that of the, of the upper respiratory strains here, they're not all from CF people. Two of them are actually from uh, from healthy uh, people. Okay, so uh, we looked at two different 
um, salt concentrations because we figure that drains and uh, upper respiratory systems probably differ in salinity. And we also looked at hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfaces. And what these graphs show is the, the bar is the mean for all drains and all upper respiratory, and then the, the rectangles are 95% confidence intervals, and then I'm showing the data for the individual strains as well. And there's a lot going on here, but I just want to focus on one thing, uh, maybe two, um, and that's that there is, uh, for drain strains, there's a significant difference in how well they attach to hydrophilic as opposed to hydrophobic surfaces. Drain strains are much better at attaching to hydrophilic surfaces. Upper respiratory strains, there is no, uh, there's no significant difference in their attachment. So um, I'm really curious at learn about learning more about the variety of, uh, of the range of hydrophobicity that, strain, that Pseudomonas is experiencing in those two different kinds of environments. Obviously in drains, it probably depends a lot on what the, what the drain is made out of, whether it's PVC or or metal or whatever, um, and um, I'm assuming it also matters where in the upper respiratory system you, you are as well. So there's a lot to learn. The other thing that I want to mention is that there's actually a strong signal of those phylogenetic groups. Those three phylogenetic groups did differ significantly in their attachment. So being able to separate that out was very beneficial in this analysis. So I show this more as a demonstration of how we are and how we, in, how we are using the fact that we have this collection to be able to learn more um, and go into more depth about the why behind what we see where. Um, one of the things that I'm not telling you about is that the, um, uh, the distribution data that we saw, when we compare where we find different species, it looks like there's some niche partitioning. So you see some, you see differential uh, representation of different pseudomonas species in different habitats. So we're interested in knowing whether or not we can look at some portion of the biotic environment and, and understand that. Now, we're dealing with uh, cultured organisms, and we're really interested in the communities as a whole, and we think that that probably has a lot to do with the, how the biotic environment um, uh, affects the realized niche of Pseudomonas. Um, but since today I'm talking about the model part of it, and we are doing some work with communities, but today I'm going to talk about one of the ways that we've used the strain collection that we have to look at this. And that's to look at the degree to which uh, um, different species, different pseudomonas species, uh, participate in piacin-mediated killing. And again, this is work that Michael France did actually for his undergraduate thesis. So we chose to look at piacins. Piacins are bactericins produced by pseudomonas. Bactericins are proteinaceous agents that kill other bacteria. Um, we chose to work on piacins because originosa uh, has been reported to, to carry a, a huge diversity of piacins. So there's much more diversity of bactericins in originosa than there is in many other groups where bactericins have been studied. And also in the strains in, that people have looked at, uh, a far greater proportion of the Pseudomonas originosa that have been looked at uh, produce piacins than is true in terms of bacteria in production in other species. So we thought maybe piacins and uh, piacin mediated killing is an important part of being a Pseudomonas. So let's look at that. So for this, Michael used uh, 92 strains um, from three uh, species groups, originosa group, uh, fluorescence group, and putative group, and they're spread as much as we could uh, evenly across uh, five different types of environments, and they came from 13 different houses. So we're trying to show we get some of the diversity that's out there. And the assay is basically you grow up um, uh, your prospective killer, uh, your producer, let it produce whatever it's going to produce, kill it with chloroform. So if there's any piacins left, they're there on the surface. And you overlay your prospective victim. And if you get clearing, uh, that's probably a piacin. So he did an all by all assay. So here are the 92 lined up um, 
uh, in their role as killer on the in the rows and in their role as victim on the uh, and on the columns. And so this is the self on self, and anything that's clear is a no killing, and then the red indicates killing. And what you can see pretty, uh, you don't need any statistics to, to see it. This all, almost everything is going on up here in the originosa on originosa interaction. So. Um, and this is not actually all originosa um, uh, proper. There's actually some uh, <coughs> other originosa group members that are in here that are participating. So originosa group participates uh, more in piacin-mediated killing than fluorescence and putative group. So that tells us two things. First of all, um, uh, piacins don't help explain why we see some pseudomonas in some places and not in others because piacin mediated killing is not, uh, they're not, they're not able to displace one another um, based on piacin mediated killing. The other thing that it tells us is that if you're an originosa, dealing with the other conspecifics that are around you is probably a really different experience than doing that same thing if you are a fluorescence or a putative. And we're really interested in understanding what the repercussions of that are for the biology of these organisms. So we're actually interested in looking at genomes at this point. Um, and we're, uh, this fall, we're going to be sequencing a subset of these originosa genomes. And our hope is that we can use some of the metadata of the sites of isolation, both the physical location and also the environments from which the samples were taken, as well as phenotypic information um, together with uh, the information that we have about phylogenetic relatedness to better understand um, adaptation to free living versus host associated lifestyles. And um, we're actually also really interested in different kinds of drains. Um, so, um, so Michael France did all of the phenotypic stuff that I showed you, Tom Hunley did all of the mini satellite work. Megan Purdy, who's a, a PhD student in my lab, Justin Ferris, Chris Brown, and Jessica Kropich were involved in the first cross-sectional study. These are all the people who have participated in sampling. Ogo and Michael are current uh, lab members who are also working on pseudomonas. Namor E is a um, collaborator, uh, MD, who has helped us find our CF families, without which we couldn't do this, and it's not housed Michael while he was doing his work in Israel, and um, NSF funded this work. So I'm happy to take questions. All right, we have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Yeah, so we sampled, we sampled cats and dogs and horses and snakes and ferrets, <laughs> quail. Um, uh, there, we, we pretty much never get originosa from animals. Um, you do get other things, in particular fulva. So we, we got a fair amount of fulva from, um, from pets. Um, but it seems like, so one of the things that our, our CF uh, clinician wanted to know was, well, how much does it matter whether or not you have pets in the home? I think for originosa it doesn't matter at all. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. I have a question. Do you, um, I mean, I, I love getting the culture collection, but do you know if, uh, even though Pseudomonas seems to be easy to grow, if there are some Pseudomonas varieties that are in those environments that are not coming up when you grow them? No, but we are doing, so we're doing um, 16S uh, higher sequencing to look at community uh, um, in drains and in soils. The, so comparing houseplant and yeah. outdoor soils. And so we will be able to get at that. All right, well, thanks again. Thanks.